world. Howdy. Howdy. I am Barbara McVeigh Gordon, and I am so happy to see all of you all. Welcome, welcome. This is uh, our first time that we'll do this, and Miss uh, Manye, our Queen Mother Filer, before we, I'm calling it order, but I will have to ask her for permission to proceed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, well, um, Monty told me there's some sort of housekeeping things that we need to say here. The bathrooms are that way, and you just, just right out the door. Uh, men on that side, women on the other. Those are very important things to know. And let, let us uh, begin. First, I'd like to recognize our event committee. Dick has been absolutely wonderful the whole time. We've been meeting every week on Zoom. Everyone's taking their tasks to heart and just run with it. So we're the two a day extravaganza, we're calling it, starting off the day, and we certainly hope you like it, and we hope that you'll come back tomorrow. So our committee, Dr. John Reiskin, who is in North Carolina right now, but he did set up uh, with Genesis. He set up the, uh, the equipment. So that's his thing. But he had planned this trip with his uh, grandson uh, quite a while ago. Carol Mosley. Carol, stand up. Here she is uh, back there at the, at the water and popcorn table. Carol came from the uh, Cultural Arts Coalition, and we're so happy to have her. Also, she's responsible for the table. She brought the table. Dr. Ayoka Soa, she's at, back at the uh, reception table in all white. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, and she's a part of the North Central Florida Black Farmers Association that donated the popcorn for the event and the movie. Genesis Leonard. Genesis. Genesis is just totally wonderful. She's a graduate student in museum studies at the University of Florida, and she is um, she works here as an intern. And she she is so creative. She done the hard work for us and you know just asked me to do something. We were corresponding last night at 3.44 in the morning and I was like, wow, this is, thank you. <laughs> so Doug Green Sr., I don't think he's here. He's part of our committee. He's a cowboy, he's a cattleman, a farmer, and he said that he is going to be working with his son who's doing the barbecue and the chicken tomorrow. Delicious. We had it a couple weeks ago when we were up in Manioka. And so he's going to help the son with that, so we won't be able to see him tonight. But he'll be here with the horses tomorrow. I would also like for our uh, board members, our Cut uh, Club Museum and Cultural Center board members, to please stay for any audience. And these people are tireless volunteers. in the operation of this uh, volunteer community service organization. So, a little pro, uh, prelude here. My uh, earliest grandmother that I can remember moved to Texas, Aunt Nancy Porter, in the 1850s. And since then, we have the Texans all the way. My grandmother was just a, a Texan extraordinaire, and she was such a Texan that when Alaska came into the Union in 1959, and it was the largest state in Texas, she was so mad. <laughs> but she got over it, and even though I was born in California, post-World War II migration, uh, grew up in Louisiana, she always considered herself slummy, no offense, there, she raised us as Texans. So this whole cowboy, cattle person culture has been a part of my life for a long time. I lived in Houston for a long time. I went to school there for a long time before I came here. So Houston Livestock Show, or they call it a Livestock Show and Rodeo, it's a really big deal. It's one of the largest in the, in the world, and not the largest. And they have interesting entertainment, not just country western or cowboy entertainment, but my daughter's in her 50s now, but when she was three years old, we went there to the Astrodome and we saw Michael Jackson. Yes, <laughs> she's uh, still 
get past the dance. So, you know, it was, just, it was a great event. Parade, it's a culture, and it's not just a show. Now, my God, just what I know I'm from Amazon.com. But when I came here, I had boots that I wore regularly. I had a hat, I had leather vest, jeans, skirts, and this is just part of your normal wear. So when I came here to Florida, I was really surprised that this was also cowboy country. I'm talking to John Nix, he will be speaking after I, uh, I, I stop. John Nix, he, his family goes back for generations. And I said, well, wait a minute, I'm a geographer, but still, I was like, where do you all have space to raise out? You know, I mean, Florida's not that big of a state, and most of them swamp, right? Okay, that's what it means. And forgive me. And he said, well, this is the way we do it. We raise them on grass fed cattle up until they're the equivalent of teenagers or adolescents, and then we ship them off to Texas to graze on the range. So we have that connection, and I'm just so happy to hear that. So that's my uh, prelude to this history event. And now I'm asking John, who's going to come up and do this thing, which is the occasion. The purpose of our, our event here tonight is the Black Cowboys and Cowgirls in Florida, there, then, and now. John. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Gordon. Um, I'm John Nix, uh, Ronnie. Uh, I'm uh, a native of Gainesville, Florida. We graduated from uh, Lincoln High School, one of the last graduating classes in 1970. And uh, I am a black cowboy. I grew up doing that. Uh, luckily, I had two types of careers two types of friends, my urban friends and my rural friends. And uh, at that time, of, you know, we were a segregated school and we had a lot of people coming in, students coming in from all the rural areas. And uh, I lived in East Gainesville at the time and my urban friends didn't always match with my rural friends. But uh, I was able to, uh, to go both ways and, uh, and be able to be friends with both the, the country folks and the, and the city folks. So uh, I really, uh, really enjoyed my childhood. Uh, I was able to uh, grow up in a rural area out in the woods and uh, spent a lot of time in my early years with my granddad. Uh, he got a chance to tell me the history of our area when so many uh, black families lived in the Rochelle area. And uh, they had these big plantations of land and how, uh, how they all came together and how they came together in this little community and how they bonded with both God and how they bonded with each other. There were two churches in our Rochelle community. There was a Methodist church, which was started by my grandfather. We just celebrated 137 years anniversary of that church. And then we had also down the road, a Baptist church, a Third Bethel Baptist church, which is also uh, in the 130th year. So we, uh, we grew up very connected. And uh, being connected like that, it, it made a sense of feeling community and feeling very comfortable. Uh, but uh, as my grandfather took me around and showed me all these things, what he was really doing, and as people say, when you're fishing, you're not really fishing, you're developing relationships and character. And that character stayed with me. He taught me about being humble and being kind. And that is definitely the cowboy way. We're very humble and we're very kind because we're connected to the environment.
We're not connected so much to people, but we're connected to the things that God created, the things that really matter. And that's just the cowboy way. Uh, a lot of, my grandfather also had a chance to tell me about the history of cowboys in Alachua County. One of the stories that I vividly remember, the story of how he told me about Prince Guerrero and how at the time, in, in the early uh, 1900s and, and the 1930s, all the prairie was used for public land and everybody that had cattle or horses could put their animals on the prairie. And then once a year, all the people would get together and they would round the animals up and put their brands and marks on them. Well, my granddad told me that they would always, every year, come and get him because he had the fastest horse in the county. And his name was Comanche, he was a black stallion. And my granddad said that what he had to do was, as these cattle and horses started to run on the, on the prairie, someone had to run around them and turn them. And that would be his job all the time. So he told me these stories and he told me how so many times he, he was the man that, that everybody came and got when they had something to do. Either a cow that couldn't pin or a horse they couldn't ride. So we spent a lot of time. Uh, there was a no fence law at the time and we had places that we would go to feed his hogs. And he would at that time tell me about, the, uh, about who used to live there and why these places were called the baptism pond, the long pond. He would tell me about the, the Coleman Cemetery and how that was created and where there used to be a church there. And these things were just so valuable to me as I grew up. And it, it connected me to the land. Uh, I have friends here who are all, you, you, you tend to bond with the people that have the same thing in common. This is a group of, of cowboys where we, we actually, I think that picture was taken, we were riding at a parade at Alancho. Uh, there's other pictures there of, of my grandson uh, when he was uh, just couldn't even walk yet. We started riding, he started riding with me. And it became like a part of of what we, we did traditionally. Uh, these pictures just show the connection that I have with, with the land and with my cattle. Uh, I have a, a saying that people die away, but the land is here to stay. And, and what I have realized is that even though many of my relatives have died away from the farm, when I go to the farm, it's like connecting myself with them. So it's always a very peaceful place for me. And it gives me that, that cowboy feeling. Um, I uh, do some workshops, and some of the workshops I talk about, I talk about the fact that in, in these workshops, you have to convince people, and it's just like, convincing a big animal that's bigger than you. You have to make sure that they want to do what you want them to do. So there's three principles that I learned on the cattle farm that I take into these workshops. One is you don't chase anything that can run faster than you. So my uncle used to always tell me, don't chase them, go around them. So when you're working with people, you don't argue with them and, and tell them that their point of view is wrong. You give them options, and you find a way to give them another point of view. Secondly, we would bring cows in, and we would have them at the gates, and they wouldn't want to go in, and sure enough, you're going to have one that breaks the bunch. And my uncle would always tell me, let her go and hold the bunch. Sometimes you're always going to have people in a setting that goes contrary to where you want to be. You can't go off and let them take you away from your point. You got to stay focused. So 
So you go around them, you offer options, and then at the same time you stay focused when, you, when you're being pulled away from your point. Third and lastly, when we're bringing cows in a gate, sometimes you have to be patient. He said, let them find their way, give them their heads. So you always back off and you let them find their way. And we have to do that with many people that we meet. We have to let them find the way to where we want them to go. So these are some principles that I've learned. You know, give an option, don't chase, and stay focused and stay patient. So what we're doing here today is we're going to take you through this museum piece. This is a, a museum piece that I found over in Palm City. There's a, there's a museum over there, and it's called Florida Agricultural Museum. And in that museum, there's um, a lady, uh, Dr. Heron. She decided that there was not enough history talked about the black cowboy. So she not only went out and found the, and, and wanted to tell the story, she wanted to tell the story with, with facts. So she researched it, and the panels that you see up here, and, and we'll get a chance for everybody to come up and take a close view of them. The panels up here actually document, starting uh, from the African roots up to the Spanish, up to the uh, Columbus coming into Florida, up to the colonial period, and under, of course, our slave uh, American rule. And then we have some pictures of some today cowboys. So uh, Dr. Heron wanted to make sure that that story was told. So uh, with some funding from the state of Florida, she went out and researched and was able to put these together. So I'm going to like briefly tell you what's, what's on each of these. So first of all, the word cowboy was used in, in the 1700s, and it was coined by the, the Carolinas. And what, what it was is it, was, it meant black slaves who tended cows. Again, 1700s, it was coined by, in the Carolinas, and it, and it meant black slaves who tended cows. So, and so long, long before that though, uh, the Africans and the New World descendants uh, were tending vast herds on the Sahara Desert. So we have, we remember, we, we talked about our, our herdsmen who, who um, walked and carried their cattle as they walked through the Sahara Desert. And what happened is we had some climate change situations there and the Sahara started to get uh, drier in the north part. So the, the herdsmen followed the path of their ancestors and they moved and you can see this on, on this um, panel when you get here. The herdsmen took their cattle from North uh, Sahara Desert down to the southern part, and they, they learned how to herd the cattle, and they herded them with, uh, with sticks, and, and they walked along. So a little bit later, um, the uh, laws and the attitudes changed under uh, well, uh, let me take you back a look. After that, the, um, the Spanish decided that they wanted, in Spain, that they um, were going to take these cattle from northern Africa and move them into Spain. So, so now we, um, Africa again was the first country or continent that started to domesticate uh, cattle. Uh, so as these herdsmen, they started to domesticate these cattle, Spain heard about it. 
and they started to move cattle from Northern Africa in 4,000 4, BC so into what we now know as pastors. So they started the first time of putting together pastors where, as we know it today, so that they had cattle that were domesticated, but they also was on a range. And they would start to prepare the grasses so that we would have what we know today as our pastors. So again, the, the first herd came from Northern Africa. They were moved into Spain. And as we know, the Spanish started this, this uh, herd, beef herd, as we know today. So uh, we, we moved back, we're now into like the 1600s. And, and at that time, uh, the, the Spanish started to really develop a market for beef. Before that time, cattle was kind of used for milk and they were used for cheese and, and, and butter, but they weren't necessarily used for meat. And, and so the Spanish figured out a way to make a business out of beef herd. They made a business out of using cattle for meat, hides, and tallow. I don't know if you know what tallow, uh, that was being able to have a, a oil that they could use. So they, they, they were the first, the Spanish were the first to start to do that. So the, the domesticated cattle were bought uh, to Spain, again, from Northern Africa. And by the 1600 BC, cattle was widespread in, in Spain. And the Moors bought slaves in, in the 8th and the 15th century. So under the Spanish law, though, we find that, that these slaves were allowed to purchase their freedom. And throughout, and, and therefore thousands of the Africans who were both enslaved and, and free started to occupy the, uh, the area. And, 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 and at this time was about the time that Christopher Columbus started to do his voyage and, uh, across the Atlantic. So Christopher Columbus bought cattle, horses, and Africans from in, into, uh, in, into our, uh, the New World. So cattle were always starting to, uh, as they came into Florida, be used on the, on the prairies, on the ranges, and, and, and ranching started to develop as we, as we know ranching as today. And, and cattle uh, herding evolved into ranching. So cattle herding is moving them from one place to the other. Ranching is the, it is the production of surplus meat and hides for sale. So it used to be where people would have a cow and they would use it for their own uh, meat. But now we move into ranching where we would have an abundance of cattle that we could actually sell. So moving a little bit further, as we move into uh, uh, this panel, uh, we're into La, uh, La Florida, and, and at that time, Cattle and horses were first bought in the Florida, as I said, by Constant de Leon. And then 1565, the first successful Spanish colony was set up in St. Augustine. And by the 1600s, many large cattle ranches in the north and central Florida uh, were set up. And, and Africans and Native Americans were employed to oversee these ranches. Then in the 1700s, uh, the Florida cowboy started to take off. And the characteristics of that Florida cowboy was the cracker horse, uh, which was a small, agile horse. He wasn't big like our quarter horses today, but, but he could get around in, into the prairies. There was uh, something else that they used. It was called a, a, not, uh, a knocking knife. 
and they used that to, to cut their way through things. And they had a, a cattle board. Like our cowboys today used the whip. They used to use a long stick and move their cattle around like that. And, and they, they had, uh, of course, the uh, Spanish saddle, which is much different than the horn saddle that we use today. They also used something that, that we have today called a cow dog. And the, the dog would help them keep the cattle together. When, when I think about all of these things and, and, and how they had to use these things, a lot of these we use ourselves as, as I uh, worked my cattle farm. Um, just to digress a little bit um, personally, when I grew up, uh, we didn't have a lot of the modern luxuries like cow catchers and things like that. So we had to do a lot by hand. Uh, we had about a thousand acres of land that we leased from the park, from the timber company. And we would run about 300 head of cattle on, on that land. And we had to bring them in once a year. And these were wild cattle. These were cattle that, that you know, we don't, you don't go out and feed them by hand. They, they made it on their own. They ate cow meadows and, and they, they learned how to find grass and find moss and, and survive in, in, in the woods. So we had to bring these cattle in once, once a year or sell them, we would sell them, we would mark them, brand them. And this is where I really developed a lot of these skills that we're talking about here, about using a whip, about riding horses, about using dogs. Uh, there's so many stories, and, and cowboys say, you know, we got your rodeo, but a lot of cowboys say, and I know this for sure, some of the best riders I ever did, some of the best cowboy stunts I ever did, nobody ever saw it. You, you know, uh, there, there's, there's times when you just amaze yourself in what you got to do. So uh, as, as we did these things, we, we came back and we did a lot of what the earlier cowboys did. We would, we would ran our cattle, and as I said, we didn't have cow catchers. So we had to rope them, we had to, my brother and I and my uncles, we had to throw them down on my hand and, and actually brand them. So when, when I see a lot of our cowboys today, I, I kind of look at them and say, well, yeah, maybe. But I don't think you could have survived what we went through. I mean, we would, we would run through woods full speed, but horses would make them kick us in the face. And, and, and my uncle would be saying, turn them, turn them, turn them. And, uh, you know, and, and you start out that week. Uh, we, it would take us about a week to bring everything in. We start out on Monday, we'd be real anxious, and by the time Friday got around, you know, we were kind of getting, oh, wait a minute, uh, <laughs> we got we to gotta go again, but um, we, we, it was very enjoyable. Again, it, it's, it's about the stamina, the endurance, and, and also just the love for what you do. So we, after we left, uh, after Florida, we, we, we went into um, the colonial time. And, in, and, and under this colonial times, uh, English invaders and their uh, Indian allies took, took a toll on these Spanish rank ranchers. And, and eventually, the Seminole in, Indians um, rounded up, up the, uh, the cattle that uh, the Spanish, they, they decided to leave. And, uh, and, and after they left, the Indians and a lot of the uh, 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 African uh, people that were working with the, on these ranches, many of the blacks uh, joined with the Seminole Indians and they became ranchers themselves and interpreters. And this is African Florida during, during that time. A lot of the uh, Spanish headed west, and, and we'll see that they, they ended up in California, they ended up in, in some parts of Texas, but a lot of them left the Florida area, and, and then the Seminoles and many uh, of the free blacks took over some of the cattle that they were leaving. So 
under the American rule, when, when um, Florida became a, a, an American territory in 1821, most of the inhabitants knew about um, the United States wanting to have slavery and, and things like that. So a lot of them left the area and they, they, and they fled, and they fled to some of the Spanish colonies. And uh, that's, that's the uh, information right here. So when they, when they did that, um, many, uh, many of the black slaves uh, actually stayed and the Indian state, they said about 500 stayed in, in Florida and about 5,000 Indians, the Seminole Indians, stayed. So, um, and they started working for some of the uh, American big ranches here in Florida. They, they worked for um, many of the ranches that are, that are actually still here today. And they were working for what, what they call the white cattle kings. So Florida became a state a few years after. So it became a territory in 1821. Then in, in 1845, uh, Florida became a major, a major cattle producing state back in, in, in 1845. But so, so the Civil War happened and during the Civil War, Blacks and, and white cowboys drove cattle from Florida north to supply the Confederate Army. And at that time, many of the, the slaves that were working for these large cattle companies, they decided to run away and they joined the Union Army. And they became drovers for the Union Army. And after the Civil War, many of the Florida black cowboys went west, and some of the well-known ones that went west was, was Bill Pitt. So, in Florida today, these are some of the giants that, that I'm standing on the shoulders of. These were men that, during the 1800s, and, and men today, uh, black cowboys, that have their own cattle farms. They 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 tend together. They gather together and they they have rodeos. They uh, support each other, and that's what it's all about. So the civil rights era, you know, brought a lot of tension. Uh, but when you move out to the rural areas and you move out to people that have so much in common, we didn't find that much tension among cowboys because you were judged in many cases as people got to know you based on what you could do and what you brought to the table. And it, it, it allowed us to, to bond. Although there was still a lot of tension and unrest and, and, and things and uh, unfairness, there was still that common denominator between cattlemen and cowboys that were judged on how well you did your job. Because it, it's, it was a rough job. And, and at that time, as I mentioned, we had to endure a lot of things in order to bring these cattle in and work them in many of the areas and hard things that we had to work them in. So, so what, I'm really wanting to do today is make sure that our young people understand the value of agriculture in general, whether, whether it's cowboying or farming, or it's just so important for everybody to understand that we have to keep agriculture because that's where our food comes from. We gotta make sure that we don't condo ourselves out of food. Uh, it's a study fight, and one of the things that I do, uh, I give my time to an organization called the North Central Florida uh, uh, Farmers uh, Association. And what we do is we make sure that we support each other in the resources that we have. 
we make sure that we help and try to make farming profitable. One of the things that we have to do in order for the next young generation to take over farming or agriculture, we got to make it profitable. And back in the day when you grew your own food and you, it, was, it, 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 it was easier because at that time, what you did, you became independent. But in today's world, it's a whole different world and the farm has to make money. So what we do at the North Central Florida Farmers Association that I'm, I'm the president of, we try to bring people in, young people, and we tell them what we're doing. We also take advantage of and bring all of us information on how we can uh, get grants and, and how we can maintain our farms. And as I mentioned, we share resources and making sure that the black farmer just not only survive, but we want them to strive. Because in order for the next generation to be able to take over agriculture, they got to make money. So if they don't make money on the land, the land goes into condos. And once the land changes into condos, it's not coming back. So we got to make sure and we try very hard to make sure that, first of all, they have that passion that I have. And, and, and with that passion, they'll find a way in which they can make money on the land. So if they're not making money, they're not going to keep it. And we need very much to try to keep as much of our land as we can. I'm going to leave you with this statistic. In, in 1910, there were 900,000 farms, black farms, black farms. We had 15% of the farms in the United States. Today, we have 0.5% of the farms. We moved from 900,000 to 45,000 farms across the United States. So we're we're losing black farms quicker than we're in the average. So it's very important. One of the things that, that I found out, uh, I, I work with Family University uh, in their agricultural program. I, I'm an agricultural engineer. Uh, I work with them in, in, in their uh, ag program. And they have a curriculum called agricultural, well, it was originally called agricultural engineering. They actually had to change the name from agricultural engineering to agricultural and biological engineering because many of our blacks in particular didn't want their kids associated with agriculture because of the, the connotation with slavery. Then they went in, a couple of years later they took agriculture completely off of it, and now the curriculum is called biological systems engineering. Because, because that word agriculture actually um, reduced the number of students. And, and that was one of the curriculums that uh, the federal government gave them in $200,000 a year for scholarship. So these kids could actually get full scholarship. But after we started giving out money like that, we did get people coming in. Now, they might not stay, but uh, they, they came in, their, their parents felt a little bit better because we took the name agriculture off and we were offering full scholarships. So uh, that, that's a program that, uh, that I'm really pushing and, and I, it gives our kids a chance to understand a little bit about process in food. Uh, I'm going to come to the end here now, and I just want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, I want you to know that there is, there is black cowboys in Florida, and that our black cowboys actually started with our herdsmen in Africa, moved to the Spanish, moved to, uh, to Florida during the colonial times, and we're still here today. Uh, I want to have... Uh, 
Rick Wise and his group to, to stand, please. Rick. young people. Uh, Rick has uh, a rodeo team and they uh, they travel around and they compete. And I have Rick introduce his, his group and, and tell uh, some of the uh, competitions that he's done. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Eric Wallace, thank you to Rick. Um, I didn't know I was going to say anything this afternoon. Um, but my friend is running, I can't let him down, so I'm not a speaker, so you have to bear with me. Um, just to pick it back on what Mr. Ryan said earlier, um, we are ranching cowboys and we are rodeo cowboys. And I did something vocal growing up. Um, when I got older, I had um, some kids that were interested in uh, riding horses, and, and uh, they wanted to try to defeat the early world. So we started that in about 2009, and I figured it was going to be, you know, one year deal, one, two year deal at the most. Um, what we've been blessed to is we started in 2010, and we're still going strong. Um, we have a Uh, just started. Hopefully, we'll get some of the videos to uh, play. Um, the real world is uh, is something that you got to have in your heart to do. Um, <coughs> you got to get away from peer pressure and and all of that stuff because it is different here in the south. Um, but I grew up on a farm, had horses, still have horses, and, and enjoy working with the kids, and we try and take them to the next level, and I can't do it alone. It takes a village to do it. Um, and I have to thank my wife for putting up with what they do, and everybody else for the Sometimes it can be challenging, but it is rewarding. Um, we were blessed and fortunate to uh, take kids uh, all over the place, uh, we have been to us before in Texas, uh, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, um, and we're hoping to get the next group to uh, be able to hear it on that board. Uh, and like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm blunting the word that I didn't know I have to do all this. But, uh, <laughs> okay, we're going to get to the video. Kids, y'all ready to hear and let everybody see who you are. Hopefully in just a few minutes we're we'll get some videos to show you um, of some of the kids and their their uh, their performance. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I want to say also, uh, uh, Rick has a, a, a actual rodeo area um, out in Williston. And uh, I've been fortunate enough to uh, to go and attend some of the local rodeos that they have, and uh, it's it's very nice. It's good to see uh, you know our our black youth actually doing things like that, rather than being on the street shooting. Uh,
ask the audience if anyone had any questions. Uh, yes.
starting gardens now, and they want to find out where they can get seeds that, uh, what did you call them, H? Not non-GMO seeds. Uh, and in, in, at our Black Farmers Association, we had uh, actually had someone come in and talk to us about it. And I see someone raise their hand. Do, do you know about that, man? Working good at launching a seeds for local gardeners, helping out to like also produce and have cost production work. So I have to go out on my own to work and put out for the taste and nature. All right, all we have to do is ask. So there's, there's different kinds of seeds that you can buy. And non-GMO seeds are a special seed that were raised in through the plants in a certain way that did not use chemicals. So uh, as people get more and more interested in their health, we, we, we find that there are different kinds of seeds and different kinds of plants uh, that, you, that you can have. And, and this is the kind of information that we share at our uh, North Central Florida Black Farmers Association. We have all kinds of people coming in to talk to us about everything from insurance to uh, uh, fundraising, uh, different ways that we can uh, uh, help each other out. And remember what we're trying to do is maintain our farmland. We're losing it. And remember that statistic. We, we're, we're down from 900,000 farms down to 45,000 farms. We went from 15% in black farmers, from 15% of the United States, down to 0.5%. And in, in Florida, we only have about 2,000 registered farms, 2,000 black registered farms. Yes? In the 1960s and 1970s, when my husband lived here, and he would go down to Tampa to the University of South Florida, that all that, that all that area in the Orlando area, there were crops and rows of oranges. And a second time to the year, but in February, the, remember in the old days, we didn't have the conditioning in our cars, so everything was, you could smell. And in February, it was a wonderful fragrance of orange blossoms. But I remember reading, not that long ago, that some of those growers were sold to developers because the land, it produced so much more money to be sold rather than farmland. And so the farmers went to Texas where they're still to find cheap land. I think we all know and can remember as we go down the turnpike of how we would see these orange groves, and now these orange groves is the villages. Can you tell us a little bit more about the rodeo we hope culture here in North Central Florida and where we might be able to see and partake of some things? I'm going to let Rick talk about that. Rick, uh, she wants to know some of the rodeo. Uh, I know one that I attended with my, with my girls were uh, the, the big one that we have in Orlando. And, and we have that one uh, around February. But we also have a large one in, in uh, South Bay, in Homestead. That's an annual rodeo. But Rick, what, what are some of the big rodeos that we have here in Florida? In this area? In this area, um, actually, as far as uh, the pro rodeo circuit, there is uh, here. There, there's these kind of scenes on here that you can learn. Most of these are program real circuit. So, series start in September and they go to actually last month. And then they start building back west of the for the summer series. Um, but we do have a couple in 
the end of June uh, will be in the seminar. Uh, and, there, and there may be some small ones that just come up um, out of the room for small rodeo companies. Uh, you just have to go on the website and see, but it's for the pro rodeo circuit. The season is, is starting to run on down the corner and we will grant the consumers uh, the United States, mainly because of the, the Florida River. Uh, and it takes a toll on the, on the livestock, so they drift back. The humidity is not too bad. Um, but there are a lot of smaller shows, but you just have to watch the website. Um, and as far as, well, you know, for example, tomorrow, now. What's the website? ProRodeo.com uh, or PCA Radio. Uh, and to back up, just uh, there is a PCA Radio, which is a small version of Pro Radio. This will be in Tampa. Tampa, Florida, this weekend, we actually come there tomorrow night. Um, the kids have a small video. Their islands have been done in Florida tomorrow, and we leave everyone in Tampa uh, for the program. Um, but you just have to go to the website for uh, RCA Review, uh, PCA Review. Okay, thank you very much. I would, uh, one, like I said, I grew up with horses, and I grew up cowboying the hard way, and my uncle didn't, didn't he made me do it the hard way. But, uh, and, and I appreciate it. I, I appreciate it very much. It, it taught me a, a lot about, uh, a, a, about cowboying and what that really means. Okay, Sister Alpha is our executive um, director for our Black Farmers Association, and uh, she's always recruiting. So uh, she just said that if we have some farmers in, in the group or people that would like to come to our North Central Florida Black Farmers Association meeting, she would like to take your information and send out to you the uh, information when we're having our meetings. Uh, we have our meeting once a month uh, on the first Sunday of, of each month. Uh, so uh, again, our objective is we have gardeners, people that do gardening. We have people that are just concerned about food and, and want to learn about the programs and, and things that are available. You know, you asked the question about the seeds. We all we, we have people coming in and talking to us about uh, all the resources that's available. So it's a it's a great opportunity to get information if you're associated with food in any way. All right. Okay, uh, the meetings are at 3 o'clock, first Sunday of every month, and we have a meeting at the GTEC Center, and then we alternate, and sometimes in order to get the people in Manioka area, we have it at the Manioka Park. But uh, typically we've been having them when we have visitors to come in and talk to us about things we have at the GTEC Center on Arthur Road. Okay, uh, any other questions? I, I would like, how many of you are like farmers, or grow men, gardeners? All right, so everybody kind of understand how to produce food and how important that is. So let's not forget that we have to take care of our soil and our land because they're not making no more dirt. And uh, we, we have to take care of what we have. And I'm, I'm a proponent of making sure that we not only have ag land, I want to make sure we do that, but then I want to make sure that we have good ag land. We have land that can produce stuff. Because, because if we don't, with, with climate change and the way things are extremes, our extreme heat, our extreme waters, if we don't take care of our land and make sure that we're doing it correctly, then we're, we're going to actually lose some of our land. I, 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 uh, I see a lot of young people in here and I want to make sure that the young people have an opportunity and know the importance of making sure that agriculture stays and that they take good care of our, of our food. Um, 
I, uh, at this time, we're going to move on. Let's give Mr. Lisa the round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. 